Stanley Street Traffic Lane Conversion Public Involvement Meeting, recorded December 19, 2017. For those of you who don't know, um, I am Mayor Mike Wiesa, and uh, this meeting is geared towards further discussion regarding potential improvements regarding Stanley Street. Um, we had a meeting last year on October 26th. We had 71 in attendance, so that was very good. Concerns from the neighborhood were brought in, concerns from outside the neighborhood were brought in. We took those back to staff, reviewed those, and we budgeted some money this year for improvements on Stanley Street. We still don't know what shape those improvements are going to come in. So the goal tonight is to talk about some of the things that we found out and to take further public input. There's no decisions that are going to be made tonight. Um, we're just looking for more feedback. Uh, we're going to give you what we found and, and take that feedback. I do have to tell you though, this, and this falls squarely on me being the, the chief executive officer of the city, uh, we knew that we wouldn't have a quorum of the council here so we did not notice it as a public meeting. However, I overlooked the fact that we may have a quorum of a standing committee. State laws require that we notice any meetings that have a quorum of any committee or any part of a governing body. At this point, we do not. Uh, we've handled that. We have three alders here, but they do not represent a quorum of any committee. Um, but for the benefit of those alders who are not able to attend, we're recording the entire session. It will be available online. Anyone can watch it once uh, John gets his editing done and it gets posted. Um, so Alderperson Morrow, while this is part of his district, Stanley Street, was here. He graciously agreed to leave so we could continue to have the meeting. The law states if we have a quorum show up at any time of any of those committees, we must stop. Um, and that's in the best interest of, of public participation, transparencies, open government, that sort of thing, uh, which is something that we will not budge on. If it happens, it happens. So I'm going to keep an eye on the door, um, and I may have to interrupt the presentation to work things out. But, um, so I'd like to set some ground rules. Public comments will be taken first by those residents who live on Stanley Street. If you live on Stanley Street, your address is Stanley Street, you will be allowed to speak first um, after the presentation, um, and then we will take public comments from everyone else. I need you to come up to the microphone. I would need you to state your name and address for the record so we can have all of that documentation. The reason we're doing it in those two sections is, is twofold. Uh, primarily, so we know what perspective you are coming from. Someone who lives on Stanley Street may have a different perspective of the operations of Stanley Street than someone like myself who uses it as an occasional commuter route, uh, which would be different from someone else who maybe drives it daily to go back and forth to work. So we want to know what perspective we're dealing with. Everyone is asked to be as brief as you can with your comments. Um, we'll allow up to three minutes per person, but if you need to take a little longer and you're still talking about things that are relevant, um, we'll, we'll try and allow that to the best of our ability. Um, so what we're going to do then is, um, before we get started on the public information meeting regarding Stanley Street, uh, Alderperson Kathy Dugan, who's in the 8th District, this school is in her district, um, she's going to talk for a couple of minutes with Mark Cordes, our Neighborhood Improvement Coordinator, about some neighborhood uh, organizations that they are uh, hoping to create. So Kathy and Mark. Thank you, Mary, Mayor Wiesler. I am Kathy Dugan, Alder for District 8. Mark Cordes, our Neighborhood Improvement Coordinator, and I have been working on beginning to start up neighborhood associations across this vast, geographically vast district. District 8 runs way, way up there, um, and then down to Sioux Marie, and then between, well, way over to Schmeekley, and then to Main Street. Um, at any rate, it's a vast area, uh, and we have potentially about five different areas that could kind of coalesce and talk to each other. And well, Mark will tell you how it goes, but I've long been in involved um, in neighborhood uh, improvement efforts, used to write for the journal on that topic, and um, I'm excited to get something like this established. I think it would probably take about a year more. 
But we, we're beginning, we've had three meetings in November in three different neighborhoods. We'll have another one in January, and then I hope for another one at the end of January. So thank you, Kathy. There we are. Uh, as Kathy said, I'm Mark Cordes. I work in community development, and I'm the only one that got the ugly sweater uh, memo tonight. I see nobody else got that. Um, if you're interested in a neighborhood association, we can certainly help you out with that. There's some information on the back table. What are the advantages? Well, if you're a neighborhood association, you have something like this come up Stanley Street, uh, drainage swales, sidewalks, issues like that, you can have a unified voice of issues that affect you within your neighborhood. Uh, you may be able to be eligible for grant funding for projects such as community gardens or uh, uh, signage that would be relative to your neighborhood or look at um, improvement projects. Uh, we just had a project done very recently in Indiana where community church had helped uh, an elderly gentleman clean up his property. So those are some of the things, there's, but there's no real end to the projects you could do. Uh, the difference between a homeowners association, or excuse me, a neighborhood association, a homeowners association, is anyone that lives within the district would be eligible to be within in the uh, neighborhood association. Again, there's information back there, my contact information as well as Kathy's if you're interested in, in that. Thank you. Thank you both. All right, so what I'd like to do then, um, as I said, there are actually four alders whose districts touch Stanley Street. Alderperson Cindy Nabel was not able to make it tonight. Alderperson uh, Sean Morrow chose to leave because it's being recorded. Uh, that doesn't mean they care any less about the issues that are going on. I want to be very clear on that. They did this so we could continue to have the meeting because of that quorum issue. Uh, the two other alders, Alderperson Dugan, who you just met, and Alderperson David Shore have the chunk of Stanley Street. So what I've allowed uh, is allowing them a couple of minutes to talk to you, uh, to talk about their concerns that they've been hearing from their constituents and their ideas regarding Stanley Street. Then we're gonna move into a presentation from our Public Works Director, Scott Badoon. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm feeling underdressed. I have been thinking lately that I need an ugly sweater um, but, you know, this will have to do for now. Um, so I, uh, I've been on the council for about 18 months now, and I feel like most of that time we've been talking ab about that issue, uh, about this issue rather, um, and getting ready to come to tonight's discussion, I was, I was actually thinking to a couple of years ago and something I heard um, when I went to a session about Land Use 101, uh, which gave us a lot of the basics of that you know, important area of the decisions we make of, about land use. Um, and uh, one of the people from, uh, from Extension said that uh, what you want to avoid with your land use uh, decisions is you want to keep from being either um, recklessly innovative uh, or stubbornly conservative. You want to be, you know, in between there somewhere and, um, you know, neither just trying wild uh, ideas uh, uh, for the heck of it, uh, nor just kind of keeping things as they are um, because they've always been that way. And, um, and that reminds me of the last time we were in the room here together and, you know, and talking about um, the, the question of, well, uh, is Stanley Street broken? Do we need to fix it? And um, one of my colleagues said that, uh, well, some of us kind of do look at it as broken and need fixing. And, and, and that brings me to, to why I think this is important. Um, it, it will help with safety, um, which is itself a good thing. Um, it'll make things safer for uh, for people who drive and for people who ride bikes. Uh, but most of all, for me personally, um, you know, I look at Stanley Street, it, it, it goes through our neighborhood, um, but it, it, you know, the way it is right now doesn't really help us have a good neighborhood feeling. Because uh, what it is now is four lanes uh, that, you know, are set up so that people can drive through as quickly uh, as, as they can, um, and uh, what I think is that if we can, um, you know, change how it's designed um, and uh, calm the traffic down uh, and um, make it so that uh, people from the neighborhood can, uh, can use it 
uh, in other ways than just driving through, um, I, I think that'll be a good thing. Um, uh, a, last, uh, a last pitch for those of you who uh, live in the second district, um, please, uh, if you would uh, either uh, grab one of my cards or, or grab me, um, I do try to email with, with constituents. And um, uh, so what is the second district? That means if you live uh, to the west of Sumeri, to the, south, uh, to the north of Ellis, to the south of, uh, of Maria Drive, and mostly um, to, the, uh, to the east of Michigan, that's the second district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and next up we'll have Alderperson Kathy Dugan. Before uh, this presentation, um, I told Scott Bajoon, our Public Works Director, that I would provide him with uh, comments from District 8 people um, regarding Stanley Street, mostly District 8 people, and I had a whole list of them. Um, and my impression, although I didn't do a complete data analysis, my impression is that most people, and some of you here now were there last year, at the meeting, many of you said the street is too fast, the street is already dangerous, why on earth would we put bikes on there and children? Um, and others said, you know, I'd like to be able to get to Schmeekly Reserve um, from my neighborhood on a bicycle or walking. I want to go hiking over there or something. I can't get across the street. Others who have said, uh, some who live on Stanley Street, others have said, um, it's hard for me to get out of my driveway and onto the street because I think it's not because there's so much traffic, but because there are four lanes and everyone's moving pretty darn quickly. So I certainly have not tried to bike on Stanley Street. I use the sidewalk, which I should not do, uh, although it's legal, but still. Um, if we had improvements to Stanley Street, if we had restriping of it that allowed for some extra space on the, on the edges, the way we have on uh, Michigan Avenue, if we have extra spaces over there, we could park the way they do in Michigan, or maybe if it were safer, we could bike. But my main, my main topic, my main point in talking about Stanley is not to get bicycles on there, but to slow the traffic down to make turning left uh, across Stanley a lot safer. It's very hard to get across. So that's where I stand, and I'm looking forward to hearing what all of you say and what our Public Works Director has to say this evening. Okay, um, so a couple of points that I think I should make um, before Director Badoon goes into his presentation. There is no plan for Stanley Street yet. There are some things that are gonna come forward as recommendations. Um, this is not going to involve the taking of any additional property. Um, the money that's in the budget is a, a small amount, I think it's $45,000, that could cover some restriping. So we're not looking at rebuilding Stanley Street or resurfacing. The most we would do this year is add some paint. Um, so I want to be clear on that. Nobody is at risk of losing any additional property. We're not taking out any boulevards. We're not doing any other um, strange property grabbing type things. Um, other people have talked about signals at some of the intersections. That's not off the table, but very likely we don't have the money to do that this year. The DOT at the last meeting um, did not see the need based on the traffic counts for signalized intersections. Now I can tell you that I've used some of those intersections and I avoid them because of the difficulty getting on. Uh, but the DOT recommendation does not uh, recommend using signals on any of those intersections. But that doesn't mean it's off the table. So we have forty-five dollars to $50,000 this year to do something if we choose to do that. This process has been long and heavily discussed and with good reason. There's no clear answer to solve everyone's problems. 
Uh, I, I use the analogy today, it's, it's like one of those pills that you take to fix an ailment, where it fixes the ailment, but the side effects are this, this, and this. So you have to choose. Is this the most important thing, or is that the most important thing? Um, so that's going to be up to you, and ultimately the older persons who are going to be voting for this. So the goal tonight, again, is to hear what we found out over the past year, and then take some additional input, take it back to the table, and see what we can come up with, and this will not be the last time we're talking about that. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Re Director Scott Badoon, our Director of Public Works, and he's going to give you a little bit of history on where we've been and what we found out so far. Thank you, Mayor. Hopefully everyone can hear me, and I'll, hopefully this will continue to work. Go the other way. So I just have a, a brief agenda here. Hopefully I'll stay next to the mic, too. I have a tendency to walk when I present, so I never know where, I, where I'll end up. Um, a few things. I've got a, a, quite a few slides together, but I think I'll move through it pretty quickly. Um, just like the mayor said, a lot of it is kind of just the, the, the history. Some of it's a repeat of what you probably saw uh, last October. I tried to elaborate a little bit on that and maybe clarify a few things and, and try to just explain things in some general terms, uh, maybe more so from an engineer's perspective. So first, just to identify that segment to which we're really discussing, just for clarification, if there is any, um, you know, probably a little bit from Wilshire here, what I'll call on the, on the west to <coughs> Fremont Street on the east. Uh, if you can see, I'll always clarify, one of the things even to point out in here, which we'll look at as we kind of go through, is uh, that the, the boundary lines that identify, you know, that street, you see vary throughout there. There's not a constant width that defines what Stanley Street is. Uh, so we'll have to account for that as we move forward. But generally speaking, uh, the, the, the right-of-way, as the mayor pointed out, you know, exists. We wouldn't need to what has been proposed, at least, to alter that in any way. Uh, and we would work with what is, what is existing. So a little bit on the conditions here. A lot, a lot of print on here. A lot of good engineering stuff uh, for myself. Uh, just a little history, this was part of the last presentation, just identifying you know, the construction there, the expansion, the four lanes in 1993, you know, based then on the engineering that seemed to present this growth. Uh, so we're trying to account for that uh, and expansion. Uh, at that time also, the designation of uh, Highway 66, uh, as identified in here, that was removed in 2009. And then even in 2014, so very recently, the right-of-way was then jurisdictionally transferred from the DOT to the city, uh, all except for that portion of it from about Wilshire back to the interstate which the DOT retains. Uh, just kind of like a little geeky thing here, we like to label streets and have things for that, so uh, functional classification which the DOT establishes for us is a principal arterial. I mean, this road is actually intended to move traffic. Uh, it's not a local road, um, it's, it, it is a road designated for heavy use. Uh, and even to demonstrate that, in 2006, the engineering staff, uh, city staff, went out to do some counts. And you can even see, too, and I'll have this in an additional slide here, uh, some counts from last October, was it, Joe? Yeah, last October. Last October, you know, to identify, you know, where sort of the traffic is. Uh, ADT is the average daily traffic. Uh, so looking at Stanley and Green on the west end, there's a little over 11,000 vehicles per day pass through there. Uh, getting over towards Michigan to the east side there, about 7,500. Uh, this one is a little bit difficult to see, trying to push everything in together. This is information from the DOT. Uh, this identifies historical traffic counts across here. The important thing I'd identify here is, you know, whatever your perspective is, is that if you read this, and this will be posted on the, on the website to make it clearer, um, but throughout that corridor, just as identified from the last slide, the amount of traffic, you know, is not consistent across the entire corridor. Uh, and also you can look through them historically, the amount of traffic also varies from year to year. So just taking one snapshot isn't always, you know, an adequate perspective. You know, we're looking historically to see what it is as well as trying to project forward from that. Uh, so what we're trying to do is work within this corridor realizing that what may seem to be extremely, you know, a good fit on one end may be a marginal fit on the other end. And those are the sorts of things we need to work for to try to improve the overall corridor. It's always a challenge. It's always a compromise. A little bit here, I'll start from the, the, the west side and move uh, eastward. Uh, the existing cross section as we look at this, and, and this is just kind of a plan and profile of what the street looks like now as you drive through it, from Michigan to Fremont, or from Fremont to, to Michigan, working from 
west to east. There's only two, two lanes, very wide, 18 uh, foot long, wide lanes. Uh, then as we move from there, the, the right of way widens a little bit. And actually then there are, that's where we get into four lanes, this side of, of Michigan, four 11 foot wide lanes. That actually expands it at Clayton and then we move to what is most of the corridor, uh, 12 foot lanes. So four 12 foot lanes that compromise there from curb to curb. To get a perspective of you know, why, what was proposed, why it was in part proposed, uh, is just looking at the current condition of the road. Uh, PACER rating is something that the state requires that we do every other year, and that's actually a, a function of the state. They tell us what the criteria is, and it just ensures that every community evaluates their streets in the same manner so that people aren't trying to get additional funding for roads because they're claiming they're in, in, in disrepair. Uh, not. So everyone's grading them the same. So what we otherwise have here from Fremont to Michigan is a seven. That's that portion of it, which is the, the asphalt portion by the, the hospital. And the remainder of it, the concrete portion from Michigan to, to green, is a five. And those are in the middle. It's a 10-point scale. Those fall in the middle uh, of where they are. These are actually fairly good conditioned uh, pavement uh, ratings. Uh, just a little bit on our current maintenance activities. These are just typical for what these ratings would otherwise be. It's just going out there sealing the cracks and, and taking care of any of the imperfections that do it. But the road itself is sound. Uh, the anticipated remaining life, which I think is an important part of trying to do decision making, is whatever we do, uh, the concrete portion of it is probably about plus or minus a 50 year life. And we're within there. So we've got you know, 20 to 30 years left you know, remaining on the road before we would be back in as a city to, to remove that pavement and reconstruct the road. A little bit, I know a lot of it has been talked about, you know, I went through some of the, the, the comments from last time and, and reading you know, the emails and stuff was on safety and I think that is definitely a big part of making any decision like this. So we looked through, this is the 2012 through 2016, the last five years of, of crash data that was available to us and, and it identifies kind of throughout the quarter. Again, it's a little bit busy, but I wanted to show this you know, as one stretch so hopefully people get a visual for what is happening here. And you can see that you know, the the, the crash results, the incidents across there, you know, span throughout the entire corridor. Um, there's not necessarily any specific area that draws attention as an engineer to myself to say that there's the issue, um, but it, it definitely is generally spread out throughout there and spread across the years that we, we have there identified. A little bit of a summary on that. So the five years we identified within here, uh, 70 vehicle and three vehicle versus bicycle vehicle pedestrian. I think actually one wasn't a, a bicycle, it was actually a skateboarder uh, within there uh, to that. 36 of which is identified here were people trying to enter or cross uh, and 14 people trying to make a left turn. And I think those are some of the important things that from an engineer we want to look at to identify what is the appropriate thing to do. You know, what are the incidents, the specific incidents and issues that we can address uh, and, and how do we best address those? Of course, the lowest cost uh, to everyone. A little bit which gets a, a, a little bit geeky in that respect is the, the information there on, on the lower part of it there, the statewide crash average. In essence, what I've otherwise laid out in there, uh, looking at the, the various numbers, Stanley Street, quite honestly, is it's an average roadway, an average urban roadway. Uh, it, it doesn't have a higher rate of accidents. Uh, it doesn't really have a lower rate of accidents. It pretty much follows along within the average of what the state predictions. So I don't know if it's every, is it every two years, Joe, do you know how often they re So these are the it's two 2016, year, Chris, year lag. Like, lag. So these are the 2016 Azures, which uses the, the five years preceding. Uh, and those are some of the, the characteristics that the, the DOT then looks at when you're trying to justify you know, improvements to, to roads, especially for any of the funding things. You know, one of the things they'll often look at are these metrics uh, here. And then just, just a little bit to try to show kind of how this is, I won't spend really any time here, but you know, time of day and, and road condition, just also as an engineer, want to look to see what it is. You know, if you identify that the vast majority of them happen, you know, in the winter time, it may really be an operational thing that says we need to get out there and do a little more sanding and salting and things like that. Uh, versus actually, you know, a, a ge geometrical, you know, issue, uh, things like that. So that's just a little bit about the road, kind of, you know, Stanley Street from an engineering perspective. Uh, and then want to look at what was proposed necessarily, uh, you know, last time and, and talk a little bit about that and just at least you know, for those that maybe weren't a part of it to let you know, you know, what that was. Uh, for those of you that you'd probably see a lot of what was presented before. 
again, starting from the uh, the west end, you know, the idea with this th to reconfigure as it was proposed uh, because of the width of the road, and they say we'd have two driving lanes, a you know, middle turn lane. In that case, the width we'd have, you know, three 12 foot lanes, and I'll get a little bit more of the importance of some of the dimensions on here. Uh, from Michigan to Clayton, uh, we'd be able to incorporate some additional features in there uh, with the extra space, as would be the same thing if we were going from Clayton, you know, towards north. Uh, what I've identified in here, shown here, are bike lanes. However, within this portion of it, there would be with a little bit of a modification here, you know, even incorporated if the thought process was more so, what is the more, more valuable? Is it, you know, that it, this isn't just a, 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 there's only one alternative that can be presented. It really does come as what is the best use, you know, of the corridor and how do we improve upon what's there? Uh, so it, we could even incorporate uh, within a certain portion of that, you know, even parking. So a little bit on the considerations there. So what I just otherwise showed is, you know, in part, why was that presented before? And here's some other just metrics um, that are always used for that. And I really want to identify this, that what I'm presenting here, you know, this identifies, you know, candidates. And I'll go through just a little bit about kind of what I mean about that. But there's really just no, you know, magic number that identifies that something is the right solution. Yeah. In the engineering world, I often always describe it, it is a compromise. There's usually never one solution that attains 100% of what we're trying to accomplish with no negative impacts, uh, to at least someone. Uh, but looking at this, what we identified here is the, the, if you remember from the other one, we're looking at about 11,000 as an ADT, that average daily traffic volume. Uh, the state, the, using their facilities development manual, they identified just a candidate, you know, road, four lane road for reconstruction, uh, for restriping, reconfiguration, about 17,500. So considerably yet over that. Breaking that down further, the Federal Highway Administration identifies some additional guidelines. Uh, in, in general, and this is, you know, I even tried to keep the wording because I think it's important to understand it in the context of what it is. Uh, less than 10,000, as they identify, a great candidate in most instances. Uh, and that typically just means, you know, if you are looking for that as an engineer and saying, you know, I want to, you know, I've got one number, will it work? You know, that's pretty much the number. If it's less than 10,000, I can nearly guarantee you that it's going to function and you will not lose any level of service uh, and you'll probably be surprised at how well it would, would operate. Between 10 and 15, it's a good candidate in many instances. Now, this other instance is that more likely it will function. Uh, however, there may be in some cases certain loss of service somewhere. It could be additional queuing. It could be a certain movement at a certain intersection. It may not be a, gener you know, a generic fit across the, the board and that would have to be analyzed at least a little bit. Uh, then when you get above 15,000, it identifies that it's a good candidate in some instances, which really means that we need to take a long, hard look at it to see how well it would fit. And then we need to balance, you know, between what is going to go right when we change it and what sort of issues do we identify may happen as a result of it. And I'll get a little more into that here in just a second. Uh, in addition to average daily traffic, there's also the peak hourly traffic flow. Uh, which, uh, you know, about less than 750 vehicles per hour, which currently um, the road from the, the counts we have would be less than that. I think there were about 600 uh, is what was calculated uh, for that. And again, it's just to see what it is, it's probably feasible. So again, those are just the metrics to identify that we have it. It still doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, it's a guarantee to work. It's just otherwise says you, you've met the first criteria now you would evaluate it, and depending upon where the traffic volumes are, is really how much more evaluation should be put into it, the level of effort, before you get an answer. Uh, other things in that, it should of course be areas uh, posted less than 45. Uh, some information about the twiddle. What you don't want to do is create the, that the twiddle. For those who don't, I kind of throw that. Out, I apologize. Is a, a, a two-way left turn lane. It's that center portion of the road, uh, and you want to be between 12 and 16 feet. So if it was you know, to be less than that, you can actually create a dangerous situation by trying to move traffic into an area that isn't necessarily sufficient width uh, and create some conflicts there. In addition, you have a possibility of using some of the additional pavement uh, in the footprint for other uses. And lastly, as I listed here, is that, uh, you know, where they actually tend to work the best is where a foreign lane facility actually works that way. So there are typically enough left turn movements that traffic typically has to, is forced to operate in the right hand lane. 
those are usually the ones that are kind of the, the guarantee. They're actually already operating de facto as a reconfiguration. It's just they don't have the striping, you know, the proper uh, paint on the ground. Just a few more slides, I promise you. Uh, a couple of, a few of the positives, and I won't necessarily go through all this. You know, some of it, probably the, the, the biggest one here that always, you know, strikes me with that is the, the accident reduction. I think looking back to some of the accidents, those, those left, you know, turn movements, the entering, you know, some of those can be probably, you know, uh, reduced, you know, with such a, a reconfiguration. Uh, low cost of implementation relative to uh, full reconstruction. Uh, so those are just some of the, the, the nice benefits of a, uh, of a reconstruction. However, you know, it's not also without its negatives. Uh, now that you have one lane of traffic, uh, you know, some of the, the more routine things that happen, you know, other daily mail trucks or, or transit vehicles or weekly, the, the garbage collection, uh, you have one lane of traffic uh, and the twiddle is not intended to be a passing lane. So as they do that, you know, it will otherwise impede, you know, upon traffic during those, those time frames. Uh, depending upon exactly how the peak hour traffic works and where everyone's destination is, it can actually create some delays during the, that time frame. Um, so there is the potential, which is very similar to the, the second to the last, you know, thought process there is to, there, there are some potentials where traffic may get queued up more. Uh, there may be periods of time where, uh, you know, as a, as a result, the, the access or cross standing may be more difficult. Uh, and lastly, just it, it, there is a tendency, the, the geometry around Stanley Street isn't so much that way that would initially concern me, but it is yet to be a concern, is that it may force people to use alternate routes, uh, it may push people to, to adjacent streets. Uh, just some of the, the general things that, that can happen. So that's enough about hopefully the geeky stuff about uh, that from an engineer's perspective, and hopefully that gives everyone at least a little bit of idea, you know, how I picture and, and look at the, the street, and in part, you know, I wasn't around at the time when the lane configuration was presented last October, uh, but just some of the reasons, even from my perspective, on understanding why you know, it was. Uh, so just to, before we turn this over, the more important thing is to find out what, uh, what your thoughts all are. It's just a summary of what was told to us the last time, uh, and I think there is a lot of you know, repeated you know, actions here. A lot of it is a, a more ladder that you know, as far as the traffic, I can't get across, I can't get access to it. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, safety was otherwise definitely a, a, a common um, element, you know, within here. Um, so there's there are numbers, and we've been looking at these and trying to see how it, it works. And, and I would actually hope that if everyone, if you stand up here, you have a comment to us uh, from an engineer's perspective, you know, if there's a specific issue that you have, uh, define it as, as much as you can. It helps in my understanding to say what it is or what it is is important to you uh, within there because even something that isn't, you know, an issue such as safety, you know, I'm afraid to make a left-hand turn or whatever, but, you know, whatever it might be, if you know the intersection that there was is or, or what specifically is, really helps that we target what the, the you know, what we need to, to do or how this will address that or if something additional needs to be done or we need to incorporate this with something else or what the actual solution is. Um, and just a few others, this is really the last slide, I promise you, um, that is, you know, the high speed of traffic, definitely a, a, a common um, issue with many people that presented that. Uh, traffic control devices, people were talking about that, and we definitely want to hear that if you, you feel that, you know, the dangers of, of bicycling on sidewalks or being out on the street. Uh, so just want to know how it fits there, because ultimately this corridor belongs to everybody, and we want to make sure that it, it fits everybody as best it, it can. So with that, I'll be looking for input and, and feedback. So thank you very much. Thank you, Director. Um, so now, as I said, we're going to open it up for public comments. I would ask anyone who has something to say, uh, comments or concerns, step forward. We need you to the microphone, though, because this is being recorded. So we want to have you come up to the podium, state your name and address for the record. Um, and then take a couple minutes to, to say what, whatever it is that your, your thoughts or concerns are. Um, I would ask that we try and be respectful. I don't think that this will be a problem, but I just want to remind everybody of that. So again, those who live on Stanley Street first. Is there anyone who lives on Stanley Street who would like to speak? Yes, sir. Come on up. You can be next, sir, if you want to start walking on down.
My name is Jackson Case. I live at 3028 Stanley Street. Um, 3028 Stanley Street is directly across from where Frontenac dead ends into it. And when the engineer was showing the slide up here of the way that Stanley Street goes, it looks kind of straight, but there's a crook in it. And I live just next to that crook. And visibility is an issue for me. So that when I'm doing something out there by Stanley Street, whether it's snowing or, you know, moving snow or cutting the grass, those cars are so close to that edge that it scares the shit out of me sometimes, you know, and excuse me, but it, it, it's, it's something that I believe to be a pretty dangerous situation for me personally in the way that my property is. So I do think it's broken. I don't have a solution, but I'm open to more discussion about it. I think that's all I'd like to say about it, though. Perfect. Um, but the visibility at that corner is an issue. So. Thank, you. Thank you. Sir, come on up. I understand that. Be careful. <laughs> you take as much time as you need, sir. My name is James Basinski. I live at 2716 Stanley Street. I'm in between Minnesota and Partners Pub. And, uh, well, it took me 10 minutes to back out of my driveway just to get to this meeting. And I personally think uh, lights on Minnesota would help. And uh, turning lights on Michigan would help a lot. Thank you. Anyone else who lives on Stanley Street? Yes, sir. My name is <clears throat> Dave Waisaki. I don't live on Stanley Street, but I operate a business on 2740 Stanley Street. I have for 15 years. I rent there and I've been, uh, that's where I've operated for 15 years. So I think I've got a right to speak. A um, Couple things, and I've been involved with this going back to sep last September, we, a year ago in September when there was a city meeting that wasn't. And then uh, a bunch of stuff I called it the dog and pony show. We won't go there any further. But as I've asked for facts about whether they about safety, et cetera, I asked an older person, uh, Mr. Shore, to, to pre present me. I wanted two years worth of facts on vehicle accidents, bicycle vehicle accidents, pedestrian bicycle accidents. He wouldn't. He didn't provide them to me. I had to ask Mr. Shore or Mr. Uh, Morrow, who is my the district the person where I live, he got them for me. There's public records from the police department, and these are two years. They're similar to what was shown here, except they're, they're two-year deals. And it was 17 vehicle-vehicle accidents. I think there were two vehicle uh, bicycle accidents and one vehicle pedestrian accident, is my recollection. Um, my personal, and again, seeing my office looks at Stanley Street, uh, a year ago this October, right after the first meeting, the city put up some temporary your speed is at the corner of Minnesota and Stanley. And the, the, the sign, the, the speed limit there is 25. And that was the flashing. And if you were going over 25, it would flash at you. Amazing how cars slowed down. It's amazing when there's some enforcement. We probably also have uh, the issue of uh, uh, I think it's a positive issue with the police department now on Michigan Avenue. I understand that Michigan Avenue has already slowed down just because there's the cop shop there. Uh, a little more enforcement at certain times of the day isn't going to cost $50,000 to do. Uh, the bicycle thing, I've had uh, statements made to me that you'll get a lot more, a lot more uh, business at your business with bicycles. I've had one bicycle client in 15 years, and that was a college student who came from Village Apartments. Uh, I, I, would, I would guess, I don't think they're here, I would guess Mr. 
Mr. Dean and Jim Shuda probably don't have a lot of bicycle traffic. Um, Partners Pub and Stevens Point Liquor, the old Charlies. I guess if you're riding a bike there, you got an issue anyway, besides driving. Um, Ellis Stone Construction, et cetera, et cetera. I know there are a couple of restaurants there. Uh, there, were, there and I don't know if it's still there. I think the, uh, uh, the auto mechanic shop. Uh, not a lot of bicycle traffic. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. If anybody has any other questions for me afterwards, I'm available. Thank you. Again, Stanley Street residents, ma'am. I'm Mary Case and I live at 3028 Stanley Street with Jackson across from Frontenac. And I just wanna say when I tried to turn left into my driveway, it's really hard. Many times I almost get back ended I end up driving down to Shuda and turning around just so I can get in my driveway. Uh, speed's very fast on that road. It's posted 35 in front of our place, but many people go faster than that. And just a comment, we moved in that home in 1993, and at that time it was a two lane when we moved in, and then it turned into a four lane, and it's just been really fast ever since then. I think it should be changed. I'm not sure what's wrong, but I think it should be changed so people slow down. Thank you. Thank you. Again, Stanley Street residents. Anyone directly on Stanley Street? Yes, sir, in the back. Hey, I'm Jack Ernest. I live on Stanley Street, 2517. I'm, I'm next to Clayton and Partners Pub. And we do have problems trying to get into, you know, on Clayton Street coming uh, west on Stanley, because the partner's pub. They got a parking lot on one side and Clayton on the other side. It's just the partners is a little further north or a little further east of us, and there's issues there. And you put in the center lane, it's gonna create a more problem. Because at least this way, I can pull ahead, and they can pull past me a little bit, and we can both turn. I can't see you having a three lane in there. I'm against it. Everybody I talk to that lives on Stanley Street's against it. Okay, and because they're talking about all these traffic and stuff that's coming here now. Now, on the other side of the interstate, they made that one a commercial lot. I see more people driving to the clinic now on Stanley Street. So that means more traffic on there, but I don't hear that. Now, if somebody puts a department store or a grocery store over there, or even a gas station, that's more traffic. So what, what is that going to do to Stanley Street? Keep it a two lane? Or two lane with a center lane? Don't make sense. It's going to be more traffic. It's another problem. And the biggest issue I hear is people crossing the street, not riding their bikes. Crossing the street. We need a light. We don't need a freaking bike lane. We need a light. You're going to spend $50,000 to paint the road. Put a light. Road don't need painted. I, I've been turning on the left lane, I've been turning left for 20 years, twice a day. I had no accident. I have no problem. I, you know, I, I gotta turn, turn on Clayton so I can get to my driveway. I don't have issues turning left. And those bicycles that want to get over to the park, if they don't put a light in, have them come down to uh, Michigan. You follow that road out to follow it up to it and get you where you want. I can't see having a bike lane well, they've got to be somewhere over there they can get up there behind the college. i seen it. Okay, you put a bike lane, lane in. During the winter, we got, what, five months of bad weather? Are they going to be riding their bikes? If they do, they're going to get pretty messy. And during the summer, I, I think we've been getting a lot of rain lately. So there, there's a lot of times bikes ain't going to be on the road. So why convert it? Don't need it. We don't need it. And cops, you know, you did say something about them trouble lights. Yeah, I follow behind a cop one day. They go a little faster than, than a normal person too sometimes. So yeah, they're, 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 they're just like everybody else. You know, yeah, they see the light, yeah, they might slow down. But yeah, cops even goes fast on that street too. And it's not, every, you know, it's not just us. 
Right, I believe I pretty well hit everything. It's just like I say, we don't need the bike lane in. Ain't nothing wrong with our roads. If you want to paint new stripes on it, paint what we got on there now. We don't, we don't need a parking lot on the side of the road. Because what are we going to do with the tr uh, dump trucks or trash trucks come through? People put their trash out there. Snow plows. Or, I mean, and bicycles. Are they like a motor vehicle? Do they need insurance? If they pull out in front of you, you hit them, it's their fault. Who's going to cover that? Them or you? That's what I'm saying. If you want to let bicycles in the road, make them pay for it. Get them insurance. They make everybody else have it. Tractors have it. Cars have it. Trucks have it. Mopeds has it. Bicycles should have it if you want to put them in the street. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who lives on Stanley Street? Yes, sir. Bigger turnout than I thought, and I'm not much of a public speaker. Dean Hegnes, 3301 Stanley Street, 30 years. And in 30 years, I've noticed one thing. Traffic's increased. The ADT that Scott gave us is going to increase. Where is Stevens Point going to grow? It's going to grow up to 66 Stanley Street corridor. So that traffic's going to increase. Do we want to spend $45,000 on a project that will need to be repainted, restriped, and redone in a few years? I think the answer is no. I think uh, making that left turn, which I do 200 days a year, and that right turn that I do 200 days a year, is sometimes difficult now. And if you stretch out the traffic pattern, then that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a particular problem for our patients, who are many of whom are older. Uh, making that turn with the traffic in a longer string, not with two cars coming abreast, but cars going tandem, is going to be an issue. Now, uh, I can think of many things that I would rather all that money I paid in, in, in taxes should go to. Uh, and the draft, it sounds like the accident rate is not terribly high. And I suspect there are places in the city the accident rate is much higher that might be a better place to spend that money. So I, I see a number of people nodding, and I see a number of people shaking their heads, but that's what I think. And remember, 30 years. I've had an office that I've looked out over Stanley Street for that entire time. And what I see is more and more and more traffic. So the ADTs that they're talking about, uh, I think I'll guarantee will increase. And the likelihood you have to go back to a four lane is not too unlikely either. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Stanley Street residents, ma'am. Lorelei Walchek, 3628 Stanley Street. Um, my concern that I haven't gotten enough information about is the intersection where the quick trip is, and if there are walking, pedestrian, biking lanes in that area, how that will work with the traffic and the huge semis, logging trucks that come into the quick trip. So that's something I just need more information about. I think putting those two together um, it has the potential for some danger. Thank you. Anyone else on Stanley Street? Yes, sir. Hello, I'm Gary Kobleski of Gary Service Center, uh, 2810 Stanley Street. Uh, this July, I'll be there 20 years. Now, all summer long, my doors are open. In the winter time, I see a lot of stuff. My biggest concern of this is that if anybody spent any time there, of us business guys that have our doors open, is the fire trucks, the ambulances, they all use that road to get to 39. 
And now when the garbage truck comes in the morning, because I come to work at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning and I leave 5.30, 6 o'clock at night. And the traffic is, it is heavy and the speeds are high. But when we did have that, that uh, show your speed thing there sitting just, where was that? It was uh, by the church. You could not believe the people that the brake lights came on on their vehicles. And the other thing is that I look at is that a lot of us guys, the trailer guy, me, we have semis and stuff that come in and drop stuff off to us. And it is, it is terrible. But the biggest problem that I have is that if they maybe do a little research and look back that some of them accidents are maybe caused because the bicycles are on the side of that road because I have nothing against people riding a bike, don't take me wrong. But there's not really a lot of respect. You think you can do what you want to do and everybody else has to look out for you. There's a lot of times you'll cross or you'll go across the street. You don't even look. Now I test drive cars there from seven in the morning till six at night. So I go around schmeekly, I go up and down both ways, both sides of the street test drive and I get to see it all. And man, spending money to take, all the money that the city spent to make that a four lane and now we're gonna spend all this money to make it back to a two lane and put bicycles on it. I mean, my biggest concern that bothers me the most is the amount of squad cars, the fire trucks and the ambulances that use that road. You tell me where them bicycles are gonna go when they're coming. You know they're not gonna get out of the way. They're gonna be there. They, they just don't do it and I don't know why. But that, I mean, that is my biggest concern. I, and I have to say the two intersections that are the worst is the one by Quick Trip in Minnesota. How many times in the summer when my doors are open, all I hear is eat. <coughs> It's nonstop. We got to do something with those intersections, and I think it would slow. It would slow everybody down. Slow them down from Quick Trip. Slow them down by Minnesota. In between there, I think we're pretty safe. But those two intersections, we got to slow them down. Make the people stop, or whatever it takes. But I'm sorry. And if if you think putting bicycles on the side of both sides of this road is going to slow the traffic down. I, I think you're using that for a pretty poor excuse. That's, you're putting people's life in danger to slow the traffic down, and I don't think that's the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had one more back here. <coughs> Hello, my name is Rob Conkle. I live at 2708 Stanley Street. I also run Partners Pub at 2600 Stanley Street. Uh, at first, I thought that this project, um, there was no need for it. Um, then I started thinking, well, am I just being bullheaded? Am I not uh, want change? So I started sitting down and looking at it. And I was trying to weigh the pros and cons. Um, trying to back out of my driveway uh, at 2708 Stanley Street is nearly impossible some day, some, sometimes. Um, early in the morning, late at night, and I don't know if a road diet is going to fix that. Um, also, I thought of my driving habits. Also, uh, I try to look at Minnesota, or no, I'm sorry, not Minnesota, uh, Michigan, where it is two lane, and I know I try to avoid that at all times. I go to um, one of the side streets that I cut over, but. Basically, I came here tonight trying to figure out where the project, where this is coming from. Um, is it safety? Uh, is it just because people think that change is, I, I don't know why, to, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know if, if, like I said, turning it down to three lanes is gonna help me back onto my driveway. Uh, and I do at my business get you know, deliveries multiple times a week, um, and that would include large semis. So I've never personally had a problem turning left into my driveway, into my business, um, you know, when I'm going east. Uh, I guess I don't really turn left coming west. But um, anyways, I don't know if there's a solution. I don't know if there needs to be a solution. I don't know if there's anything wrong with it. 
Uh, if we're talking about safety, I do think the intersection on Minnesota is a, uh, is a problem. Uh, however, if the numbers don't justify that, then maybe it's not. To me, it seems like a problem, but maybe that's just because of my location and I see it. Um, other than that, my other concerns, as the other gentleman said, are the emergency vehicles. I'd like to get perspective from, you know, not the commander in chief, but people who actually drive, you know, the, the ambulances and the police cars and, and see what their opinion is on, you know, driving down a three, three lane road. Um, that's just my feelings, I guess. Uh, so I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> I guess if I had to vote one way, I would vote for no change. So, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else on Stanley Street? Directly on Stanley Street. Okay, we're gonna close off that section then of the comments. Um, if anyone watching this or listening um, on 105.9 has comments, uh, direct them towards my office, Director Badoon's office, or you can contact your alder person. Um, I, I wanna state be, in this little segue here that we don't know what the solution is either. We're not even 100% sure what the problems are. That's why we need you. Concerns have been brought up about safety and speed and intersections. Um, those are things that Director Badoon is gonna take back to his office and evaluate to see what improvements we might be able to make. Um, so we're, we're unclear as to what the, the, the real problems are and that's why we need you. And that's why I asked the residents to speak first. So now, anyone else, we're gonna open up the comments to anyone, I ask that you raise your hand um, and take your couple minutes to speak. So, yes, sir. Good evening, folks. Bob Ostrowski, 516 Michigan Avenue. Reviewing this thing, I'm looking back and forth and I'm trying to, like the gentleman just said, why? Because I'm trying to figure it out, why change anything? I remember back in the 90s when Stanley Street was rebuilt. Most people didn't want to lose their boulevards. They liked them. They kept the snow out of their front yards and they liked them. But it was to move traffic along better. By golly, it's done that. Traffic moves. You come out of St. Stan's Church, you come out of the hospital, you can go head on out. You run a fire truck, you run ambulances, and oh, they run ambulances. They got a nice wide shot to take out. Now you're gonna identify non-usable lanes. And I wanna correct somebody. Somebody said, well, if we put bike lanes, we'll be able to maybe park. Why do you want a bike lane if you're going to park in it? Second of all, I live on Michigan Avenue. We would love to have a bike lane that we could park in. We had a boulevard. It was taken away from us so century people could get to their work faster, quicker. I can tell you the corner of Michigan and Stanley, school buses, logging trucks, fire trucks, uh, you do anything to narrow that up, you're asking for suicide. Another thing that comes to my mind, why don't we give it a little break? I'm the guy that made the comment to Dave that since we put up the Stevens Point Police Department sign on Michigan, traffic has slowed down. Oh boy, in fact, the police weren't even moved in there for two weeks, but the sign was up, traffic already started slowing down. Another thing, when those temporary signs go up, those flashing signs, I noticed it last summer when we did it by P.J. Jacobs. P.J. Jacobs can be a suicide path on Highway 10. Not when you put up those signs, brake lights come on faster than all oh, heck, and they're all looking around to see if there's a bubblegum machine gonna pick them up. So you know what? A couple of those signs, why don't we try it for a while? See if that slows down the thing. I agree with Mr. and Mrs. Case. That corner, that's a vicious corner because that's just about the time people finally decide that they're not on, a, on I-39 anymore and they should slow it down. That's a good place to put one of those signs. I also, I have a strong feeling in regards to 
the number of police cars that are going to be there. The police department now is about two and a half blocks from the start of that section we're talking about. The patrol cars, I can assure you, are going to be out there more often. They're going to be using that route. They're not coming from Strong's Avenue downtown. They're coming now from two and a half blocks away. That's going to slow traffic down. I can guarantee you it is. Plus, I have the chief's assurance that it's going to be enforced. I do have a concern about ambulances. Ambulances, I just recently been involved in a battle about timelines for ambulances. People objecting that the ambulances weren't getting places fast enough. Now you want to mark a road that the ambulance may have to slow down? Remember, they have to follow the law just as much as we do. They're not allowed to go 90 miles an hour just as they want, but they do like to have an open path that they can get through, get around, get past. Uh, as the gentleman commented, I would say there's probably seven to eight runs a day. And now, if we remember right, we now have something in point we didn't have before. We got flight for life out at the airport. If your family member is coming in on that thing, or if you got an M family member being transferred from the hospital out to flight for life, do you want somebody on a bicycle holding your family member up? I'm not saying I'm 100% against this anymore because I just recently spent two weeks in the San Francisco area. You talk about bike pass, they got more bike pass than they got car pass. They got bike pass there that you're not allowed to enter with a vehicle. But you know what? They got weather 12 months of the year. They can use it. And by the way, people drive right through those bike lanes anyways. And quite, they made us look slow. So I'm not sure that's the answer. Uh, another thing that comes to my mind, somebody mentioned a little while ago that, well, this is a residential neighborhood and it'll help slow things down. So I did some thinking. Is another street that we might think about doing this to, if you take Dixon Street, and go north to Fourth Avenue on Division Street, that's predominantly a residential neighborhood. You want to try putting three lanes on Division Street? I think you might have a revolution in Stevens Point if you tried it, but it's no different in a way than Stanley Street. I just think what we need to do is more study, but to give the posting of signs, to give the police department a little more time. We're in no rush. This has happened for a long time. Let's give law enforcement, let's give common sense uh, a little more time before we go and spend the money. I'm sure we can use the money elsewhere in the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just for a little context, for those of you who may not know, uh, Mr. Ostrowski is a member of our Police and Fire Commission, uh, so he speaks with at least some semblance of knowledge regarding emergency vehicles. Next person. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Darren Palmer. Uh, we're at 3310 Stanley Street. We own Wilshire Trailers. We've been there since 2011. Um, I guess some of my concerns, going back to what the older person said when they started this, this evening, is that to me it kind of seems like your guys' mind is made up already as to wanting this done, even though we're here listening for reasons not to do it. But just listening to both you and Mrs. Dugan talk, it kind of seems like your minds are made up already. Um, the ambulance thing is definitely a concern. You know, when we're working with our doors open all day, them ambulances, you can guarantee, are going by steady. I work on a lot of the EMS and firefighters' motorcycles, and they honk and wave to me, and they're going by all the time. And to have something slow to traffic down, you know, would not be, it just doesn't seem like a very good idea. And it also seems like a, a lot of money to experiment to see if it's a better idea or not. It just seems like that amount of money could be used better elsewhere. But I guess that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Next, ma'am.
Hi, I'm Lynn Schulist. I live at 408 Glennon Avenue, just a couple blocks from here. Um, I am a lifelong resident of this area. I have about two decades of experience um, on Stanley Street, part of it being a commuter from the town of Bevent, where I grew up, um, as well as living within District 8 um, on, in the Doolittle Apartments, as well as currently where I am right now. Um, I have a teenage son. He commuted when weather was nice um, to PJ Jacobs um, to school. He um, said he didn't want to come here because he'd rather go to the hockey game, but he did ask me to say this. Um, what is the problem? I never felt scared biking on the sidewalks on Stanley Street to PJs, and this is between ages 13, 14, and part of his when he was 15. So that's one example of a biker um, and their safety concerns. Um, I also have a very close friend who lives um, next to the cases um, for the past five years, and we do ride sharing um, our kids to school, now SPASH, um, and I, I can't agree more. Um, I've experienced your pain um, living there, and um, especially during um, what I call point rush hour in the morning um, before and after school. Um, I also have to, um, when the weather is bad, take my son to Spash, um, and we crossing Minnesota Avenue. It's our inside joke in our family. It's like Russian roulette some mornings. Um, I think um, spending a lot of my career in the Chicago area for work, um, traveling, on business trips, I feel like um, the wait times um, can be comparable to some of the busy suburbs like Schaumburg and Buffalo Grove um, during their heavy commuting time um, because there is no break in the traffic. Um, that's why, whether it's going fast or not, I agree. Um, it probably could slow down, um, but I would like to challenge um, th the city and Scott respectfully to see if there's any other options available that we can afford and fit into the budget um, to help, I think, solve the real problem of slowing down traffic um, with allowing for some breaks in traffic because I think you're gonna take two lanes of traffic, put it into one, and there's just gonna be no break. And you know, I am super empathetic to those who live on Stanley Street having to back in and out of um, their driveway or the businesses having their customers back in and out during those rush hour periods. Um, and I think I stated all my points, so thank you very much. Thank you. Next, yes sir, you in the back. My name is Rick Zahn and I live at 2253 Frosty Pine Court, which is in the town of Hull, about two, not, two miles north of Century. Uh, I drive my car more than I bike, but I am a bicyclist and I do commute to work on occasion, uh, uh, maybe a third of the time, and I, live in the, or I work in the business park. So I have to cross, not ride parallel to Stanley Street, and I've crossed at uh, Minnesota, Wilshire, uh, try to avoid uh, Michigan because there's just a lot of traffic north-south there. So um, I guess my biggest concern is the width of the roadway. Uh, we, we talked about traffic and from the proje projections, ADT and Scott, just if I'm going to paraphrase this so I understand it, in 1993 was about 10.5. Projections were made that by 2013 it was going to be 17,000. But current, the most current uh, counts range from seven to 11,000. So uh, the facility, the way it is configured now, has lots more capacity from a design standpoint. Is that true? As far as, I mean, what would be an, AD, what would be an ADT that in a four lane configuration Stanley Street could handle? I mean, way more than it's handling now. So, so there's, there's plenty of room for growth, I guess I would echo a lot of other concerns that people have is that from a, a, in a bicycle mode, when you're trying to cross that width of pavement and you have uh, traffic in four lanes, it's very difficult. So uh, traffic calming, enforcing the speed limit, perhaps some one or two points where there could be uh, you know, flashing lights that would accommodate for pedestrian or bicycle movements as well as 
uh, through traffic. I don't know if we need to go to full traffic lights or not, but uh, from my perspective, that's my biggest concern is the crossing movements. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next, ma'am? I'm Jan Way, and I'm out on 1203 Wilshire Drive. Um, and I feel like I'm representing a lot of people from the town of Hull because uh, even though we don't live on Stanley Street, we use it an awful lot. And coming in on Wilshire by the quick trip um, to make a left-hand turn, or if any of you have had the <laughs> privilege of coming out by the Honda and Scafidi to make a left-hand turn and have to quick it in the right-hand turn so you can go on to 39, uh, you're really taking your life into your hands. Um, Several years ago, it wasn't too many years ago, the state had uh, suggested they were going to, I believe, put in two roundabouts. Uh, well, the state says they have no money anymore, so we can't do that. But I think that we need to have another situation where we have a calming moment down by Quick Trip uh, or in that area, because like the gentleman that spoke prior to myself, just getting across or making a left-hand turn is very difficult. And I speak both as a bicycler and from driving a car, um, getting across those streets. I would never take my bicycle down, <clears throat> excuse me, Stanley, but I do need to cross once in a while. And you know, you just wait until you get a chance. So um, I, I, I want traffic to slow down. I'm not sure how that should be done but I just wanted to bring up those couple of uh, uh, problematic situations. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Ma'am? My name is Michelle Thrun. Uh, I lived for over 30, almost 30 years at 3505 Stanley Street. My mother still lives there. I have had the privilege of driving on that street since 1980 when I learned to drive. And I've heard a lot of the several viewpoints put through here tonight. Some of them made sense, some of them were way out. But I agree with those people that say that this traffic reconfiguration thing is a mess. It won't work. I can remember when Highway 66 at the time was a two-lane road. I had to learn to drive on that road. There are several times I've almost gotten rear-ended on that road or otherwise schmucked. I take my life into my hands on that road sometimes with all the semis and logging trucks, et cetera, et cetera. And the bit with the ambulances four or five times a day there are times I have seen the ambulances have to slow down because they cannot get around these people. There are times when I myself plus other people have had to try to get around a bicyclist in the road and the traffic has gotten snarled because of the bicyclist being there. I myself don't understand why the bicyclist can't be on the sidewalk. I always was on the sidewalk. I would never, never go in that road with a bike. No way. You're taking your life in your hands if you do. But turning it a road that is too fast and too messy now and making two less lanes, putting it back to the pre-1993 and then wanting to put parking spaces in front of my mother's house? No, no, that, that'll never work. Please have some consideration of the people that live on Stanley Street and have to put up with this thing day after day. Even though I don't live there, I am there every day and that's all I've got to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, ma'am. Um, 
My name is Garolyn Nitka. I live at 3528 Stanley Street, right across from Quick Trip. And I want to just go on record saying that I agree with um, the businesses that are on Stanley Street, Gary's, and the people that talked earlier. And one game that we play in the summer, I just want to tell you, is we sit out in our yard swing, and my husband and my neighbor and I will say, let's count the cars at Quick Trip. And you cannot pinpoint the number, like we'll all count at the same time. 22, no 23, that one left. And it's fast, and it's fast paced in there. And it's really scary sometimes. I've had to call 911 for several accidents. My husband's held a woman's hand. I run towels out for blood. And so I don't want to see it go through lane. It's going to be scary. And so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next, him. My name is Deborah Shuda, and I own um, 3609 Stanley Street, which is uh, near the Wilshire and Stanley intersection i want to say that i would prefer that it stay a four lane um, i was one of the people that was involved in a bad car accident um, i was hit by a drunk driver and had it been a two lane i probably would have been dead um, so i kind of compare this to the um, highway 10 east where you've got the middle lane you've got the two lanes on each side and there are so many times where when I'm um, trying to turn left, I have to wait. Um, I think we, we live in a, um, a very high, fast paced lifestyle living. Um, everybody's always in a hurry. I think we need to just be patient. And um, uh, I, I think that we should continue to just have the four lanes. Um, I don't oppose bicycle lanes, um, but I just don't think that that's the right area to have them. So with that, um, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, I saw something over here. Yes, sir, you in the back. My name's Bob Wurzba. I drive Highway 66 or Stanley Street at least twice, sometimes up as many as 10 times a day. Um, when the people started talking here tonight, the first thing they said was this is a neighborhood. But the majority of the people that first came up were business owners. Dr. Hagnes, Rob Conkel, um, Gary Service, uh, Wilshire. So we've got a mixed neighborhood. We've got businesses. I think if we're going to spend $45,000 on something, we should promote the businesses in the neighborhood, uh, the people that are you know, earning this. You know, they've been out there. Um, the bicycle traffic chooses to use the sidewalk. If I were representing that district, I would listen to the people. And if the bikes choose to use the sidewalk, let them use the sidewalk. Don't give them a bike lane and force them out onto the road. I mean, they've already told the district what they want to do. It's not really broken. Like you say, I drive it, I'm in and out of there six, seven times a day. Sometimes I'm pulling a trailer, sometimes I'm driving a truck. I do a lot of property maintenance. I have a harder time trying to back out onto Main Street or Division Street if I'm working on a house than I have on Highway 66. Patience is usually the key for me. Most of the accidents, if not all of them, are due to driver error. People are either impatient, they're, they're in a hurry to get someplace, They've got to get ahead of at least one more car so that they can get to work instead of waking up five minutes earlier and taking a little more time to get there. You know, we've got a lot of accidents everywhere, and they've said that there's not more accidents there than any place else. It's just that right now we're talking about them. People are patient. They'll get where they want to go. Dr. Agnes can vouch for that. He has more patience than all of us. Um, that's also the corridor coming in from Ellis, Polonia, Rochelt, Shantytown, Wittenberg. People are using Highway 66 to get out to Anago. You've got truck traffic coming in. The log traffic has slowed down a little bit since Consolidated's closed down a lot. 
um, but there's still a lot of traffic on there. By bottlenecking it as it's coming into town, we'll wind up with a situation of two things. The people that are living on there as residents are going to be listening to a lot more start and stop traffic. This is what happened over next to Consolidated on Water Street. They put a four-way stop in. I owned a house on that corner at the time. From that day forward, my tenants complained that everybody stopped, and then you heard the diesel engine rev up, and they'd go through about 15 gears getting out of there. Before then, they would just roll through. So you're going to create a little bit more of a noise problem if people don't mind the noise. That's not a problem. But for the people that are living there and sleeping right next to the street, they're going to be listening to that all the time. Lights are good in some instances. I think in this point, people need to just sit back and look at it. It may slow down with the uh, police department being out there. Um, again, my personal is if I'm going to spend $45,000 in that neighborhood, let's promote our businesses. Thank you. Next. Last call. You, sir. Trevor Rourke, 601 Washington Avenue. Um, I actually drive this route uh, about one, two times per week because uh, Graham and Grandpa live off of Torrin Road, so I'm taking the kids out there for uh, child care, which is great. Um, it's definitely a fast street. Uh, every time I drive it or every time I'm, sometimes I bike it um, just to try it out, you know. Uh, but I am afraid to bike it. It's, it feels very dangerous. Um, there's been a few points that I just wanted to maybe have uh, some maybe further discussion on that have been mentioned tonight. One was why can't bicyclists just ride on the sidewalk? Um, if you're young, uh, I, I actually push my kids on and keep them on the sidewalk, so I think that's great. Um, but if you're an adult or even uh, high school or older, riding in the street is actually where you're supposed to be according to Wisconsin Department of Transportation. Um, even though our municipality is very flexible on that, which is fine. Um, the problem I see the most is how many bicyclists stop at every single driveway and every single intersection. So if, especially the intersections, if those bicyclists are not stopping at every single intersection when they're just driving on the street, we're going to have some major crashes. Uh, and I think that is a potential danger when you push people onto the sidewalks only. Um, I actually do have kind of a legal question regarding uh, the center turn lane. Couldn't emergency vehicles use that center turn lane? Isn't that legal? It is legal. Okay. And then not also... Not always available. Right, not always available. Um, same with the four lane. You can't always have everything available. Um, but that's a possibility. Also with backing out of driveways, I'm thinking that's still legal to back out onto the center turn lane. Is that right? Kind of like a refuge? So that might be possible as well. So an additional opportunity to get out onto the street. Um, and I, I'm all about promoting business. Uh, I'm in the, I've been in business for a long time. Um, and I think when you look at cities around the world and their streets are slower and they have more people, more types of transportation using them, those businesses are more viable. They're actually more um, more friendly, more social, more neighborhood-esque. So t I think there's kind of a, uh, what's called a false dichotomy like created. There's this perception that if we don't have enough car space, then we're not going to have enough business. We're not going to have enough revenue. And I think that's not, I don't know if that's an accurate assumption. Um, and also just regarding growth, um, that a gentleman made a point about um, how much the city is growing as well as how much is growing off of, off of Stanley and further northeast of the town here. And um, with that ADT they mentioned before, with it only jumping around seven, 800 cars per day, to me that says that people are driving less. So over 24 years, we've only increased seven to 800 cars per day. That means younger people are driving less, and that's actually a, a, a real trend in the United States. So people in college and so millennials and also Generation Z are actually driving less. And so they're wanting more, more options for transportation. 
So thank you. Thank you. I think that was it. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Uh, we, we, we had your time. Uh, that was Alderperson Shore, for those of you who can't see. Uh, but the Alderperson's got their chance to speak. All right, so what we're going to do now, uh, first of all, anyone who hasn't signed in yet for tonight, please sign in. Um, we've got a video record of testimony, but we don't have a record of everyone that was here. Director Badoon is going to take the information back to his office, uh, and we'll probably meet tomorrow on this, to talk about some of the trends. What are the concerns? Um, and then we're going to evaluate those, and at some point in the future, probably the near future, we're going to come back with a recommendation, or maybe two recommendations, or maybe three recommendations. Um, they will be held in public meetings, just as this one is, but they may be in a more formal setting, a committee or a council, something where we may need to take action. Um, if it's street lights or reducing the speed limit, all of those things uh, require council action. If there are any comments from anyone that is here that may have forgot something, or anyone watching or listening at home or online, you can direct those comments to your older persons, you can direct it to my office, or you can direct them to the Director of Public Works. And with that, um, I think we're going to close out. I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, a Happy Holidays, um, and a Happy New Year. If you could, because city staff has been working all day, and it's uh, after 8 o'clock now, if you could help by folding up some of the chairs and putting them in the racks, that would help break down things a little bit quicker, and we would appreciate it. Uh, if you have to go, I understand. But thank you all very much for coming out tonight and uh, look forward to uh, reading about something as soon as we evaluate these comments. Thank you. A video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com slash videos.